My name is uh, David Sher. I'm a cardiologist. Uh, I practice at Lancaster General and Medicine. I'm also a clinical associate professor of medicine uh, here. And um, I, I've been uh, interested in working in the area of digital health technology for about 20 years. Uh, we have a great panel of uh, people who are going to um, present some remarkable things. And, you know, I always, I have this dictum that says, technology is not a solution, it's a tool. And it only becomes a solution when you're solving a problem, number one, and number two, when it's incorporated into a system of human interactions which really oversee the uh, project or, or process with the aim of helping the person at the end, which is the patient. So without further ado, I'm gonna um, start, we'll start with uh, uh, Jennifer Krasnuski. She's um, Associate Professor and Vice Chair of Research uh, here and Chief of the Division of General uh, Medicine. Thank you very much. I think I have some slides, but I'm not sure how to get this. Oh, look at how fantastic technology is. <laughs> so I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you for inviting me to this panel, and, and thank you all for coming. Um, I want to talk a little bit uh, first about our Penn State Project Echo. So what is Project Echo? Project Echo was started in 2004 at the University of New Mexico, and it was started by a gastroenterologist with this really great idea. Uh, he knew that his patients had to wait between 6 to 12 months for their treatment of hepatitis C. And they had to travel all the way from the rural parts of New Mexico to the university to receive that care. At that time, there weren't any primary care doctors treating hepatitis C within the state because he looked. Uh, and, and there was a good reason for this. The treatment regimen was complicated. It was a chemotherapeutic type of <laughs> regimen. But when it came down to the actual details, he realized that there was nothing intrinsically complicated about that that couldn't be taught to primary care doctors to enhance the ability of patients to receive this care closer to home. And so he developed Project ECHO. Project ECHO utilizes a telehealth platform. At this time, we're utilizing the Zoom platform, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And he brought together a team of experts from his university setting that we're so fortunate to have within academic medicine. It wasn't just himself as the gastroenterologist. He had a pharmacist, he had a psychiatrist, he had a psychologist. Um, he also had a pharmacist, a social worker, and other individuals who are all integral to the complete care of the patient. And then he had utilized the telehealth platform to have the primary care doctors join. Not just one, but up to 20. And each time, each session, the primary, a primary care doctor would present a patient case be identified, of course, for patient privacy reasons, but a very standard presentation of what challenges they were dealing with in treating their patients. And they would ask that to not only that team of experts from the university, but also from their fellow primary care doctors. So it was an all teach, all learn scenario where the primary care doctors would learn from each other. Patient cases aren't too drastically different, even though we know every patient is an individual. And the experts would provide this input. And over time, he enhanced the ability of the primary care doctors to treat their patients. So it's important to note that this is very different than telemedicine. So telemedicine is one-to-one -one treatment, a uh, physician providing consultation to another physician uh, in, a, in a situation that's specific to one patient, or perhaps a physician providing that treatment to a patient. This is a different concept with a multiplicative effect. So we're currently offering this here. For the last year, we've lost, launched Penn State's Project ECHO. We're one of over 200 universities across the country, um, but we have a little bit different mission where we're really focusing on building the evidence base for this approach. And you can see our outstanding team of experts were all gathered around, and then the Zoom platform with the what we call our Hollywood squares of our participants were calling in. We were funded by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or SAMHSA, uh, for our first ECHO, which is to enhance primary care doctors' treatment of patients with opioid use disorder and using medication-assisted treatment. This is some of the progress we've made, so this points out the counties across the state that we've been able to reach, and really amplifies the ability of this telehealth platform to bring the education from where the experts are to where they need to be across our state. 
these are some of our early results. We're fortunate to have an outstanding team of experts and they've improved both the knowledge and confidence of our providers in providing care to their patients, as well as decreasing professional isolation, which is the critical point when we hear uh, a lot about physician burnout. We've also partnered with the Department of Health to utilize this platform to work with actual hub and spoke models where now they're not presenting patient cases during the echo session, but presenting the challenges of working with spoke clinics. And lastly, we were just awarded a second SAMHSA award to uh, increase the use of screening, brief intervention, referral and treatment, otherwise known as SBIRT by those in the field, to enhance screening for and treatment for adolescent alcohol and other substance use in 10 rural counties across the state. This will be a partnership with pediatricians and school personnel to help improve these screenings. I wanted to include a quote just to close out my slide from one of our partners, and it really highlights to us the power of ECHO, the power of this partnership, of this created network, and working with those who didn't have a network prior. And you can find our team on our website and on Twitter, and happy to answer any questions when we get to that part of the panel. Great, thank you very much, Jen. Um, next up is uh, Andrew Geronimo. He's the assistant professor of neurosurgery here. And um, without further ado. Thank you. And thanks for inviting me here today. I'm glad to be here. If uh, none of this makes sense from the perspective of neurosurgery, it's, I just like technology so dang much. I go where, it, where, it, where it, it's needed. So um, I'm going to talk about um, the methods we use uh, regarding telehealth in the ALS clinic here at the Hershey Medical Center. Um, Dr. Simmons is a neurologist who uh, runs the medical center. A lot of this is possible due to him. But he has partnered with the university and Penn State Health to be part of the um, on-demand platform that Penn State has launched. And we are one of the clinics that uses it since uh, earlier in 2018. Um, you can see our mandatory map of Pennsylvania with our, our, the patients that we've seen over that telehealth platform. Um, and, uh, you know, people who come to ALS clinic, I guess I should describe what, what that's like. They travel up to three hours to come to clinic for about a four-hour visit where they're seen by ten different people. It is exhausting for someone who is in good health. For someone who has a neuromuscular disease, it can be absolutely exhausting. Some people spend another night in a hotel here just to make it back uh, up to where they're, they're going to. So um, when we launched the telehealth program, we thought we're going to get all of the people in the northern tier of Pennsylvania who, who come to our clinic to do telehealth exclusively. And we found that that wasn't, it was true, but it wasn't the whole story. Most of the people we actually see through the telehealth platform are 20 miles away from the, from the hospital. It's just a disease that... Um, makes the option of telehealth very uh, much appreciated. So my piece in this, and I have two little pieces that are in the lower boxes there, are on the um, little bit about mobile, mobile health, tel mobile health and, and telemonitoring. Um, I have two projects that we're working on. One is uh, sensing fall risk in these patients with the use of inertial sensors. Um, and the other one is remote assessment of breathing functions. So these are both made possible by advances in wearable technology in the case of the, the inertial sensor and also new technologies which enable us for patients to measure breathing from their home using an app on their smartphone. So we're in the pro we've, we've validated both of these and we're in the process of doing um, long-term home monitoring. I, our idea is if the patient is seen every three months and the disease progresses from start to end in about 24 months, some of them might progress very rapidly in a three-month period between when we see them. So we want to be able to catch if they have um, breathing difficulties in this three-month period and initiate some sort of um, non-invasive ventilation intervention in that time period. Same thing with falling. If someone has a rapid um, progression of their fall risk over that three-month period, we want to be able to measure it, and we can do this using the sensors in their homes. So two little projects with how we're using telemonitoring to improve uh, ALS care. Thank you. Um, next up is um, uh, Derek Holt, and um, 
He uh, is the President and Chief Operating Officer of K4 Connect. He's, he's actually going to discuss what we touched on uh, previously about um, what the challenges of um, looking at patients uh, in, in the home. Uh, so thanks for having me. Uh, I'm also a Penn State grad. And I live in Raleigh now, so it's good to be back. And I was born in Lancaster General, so I've got a bunch in common here. Uh, just really quickly, I wanted to talk about um, a population that quite candidly is typically overlooked by technology uh, companies, right, uh, which is older adults. Uh, too often we're building the next great thing for connected wellness, uh, smart home, et cetera, for the next generation and not thinking about uh, the current generation. And so K4 Connect is really a, a company that, that is a venture-backed technology company focused on building solutions specifically for older adults, individuals living with disability, and then ultimately uh, those that uh, care for them. It's always bad when the technology guy can't use the PowerPoint side. Uh, the, the, uh, the company, uh, we've raised $27 million in venture. There's a lot of heat and light right now on the changing demographic. 29 patents, this says 25. Uh, and we really got this cool team of gerontology kind of backgrounds, uh, long-term care uh, providers, uh, senior living executives, and engineers that we've kind of brought together to really focus in on uh, the longevity economy. Uh, this audience knows this, but I, I show these slides often. We always talk about the baby boomers uh, being uh, in this older adult category. They're actually just showing up now. Uh, 10,000 people will turn 65 uh, today and 10,000 more will, take, will turn 65 tomorrow and that rate is increasing um, as, we, as we see uh, from the graphic above going from 42 million folks over the age of 65 to uh, 80 million here in the next 35 years. Um, additionally, this is a global challenge. The darker colors here mean there's a larger percentage of the population is older. This is 2015, this is 2050 going from globally 8.5% uh, over the age of 65 uh, to some models showing now over 20%. Countries like Japan having over 40% of their population over the age of 65. This is not a macroeconomics panel, but there's a whole bunch of discussions that need to be had there in terms of pet tax bases and how we're gonna pay for this. But to give an example, Japan more recently has mandated long-term care insurance, which has broadly been a unsuccessful product in the United States in terms of viability. They're mandating it to every citizen that's over the age of 65. We are not having enough of a discussion about this population and frankly the impact that it's going to have uh, to our healthcare system. So we believe that ultimately technology is poised to do one of two things, uh, enhance or disrupt or a combination of the two. Um, I describe the disrupt part, which is, uh, I'll use Uber as an example of disruption. Uh, who wants to invest in a taxi medallion today? Nobody. Um, they've come in and blown that model up and they're the world's largest taxi company and they own no cars. Relatively meta when you start to think about it. Um, but then at the same time, there's a huge opportunities to enhance. And we're working with some of the, the leading long-term care providers, um, soon in homes with Medicare Advantage, as well as uh, a lot of the long-term care providers are starting to provide uh, uh, care in the home as they expand their, uh, their impact. And uh, I'll skip through a couple of these things. Basically think we're doing smart home for older adults. It was the, the 70s that, that laws were passed that would give tax reimbursements for ramps and pool bars. That's where it stopped 30, 40 years ago. This technology, smart thermostats, motion sensors, light switches, voice uh, enablement uh, is not something that is just a novelty for older adults. It's actually absolutely a, a utility. And we're starting to gather the data that we can help folks live in whatever life phase they're in today that much longer by a lot of the technology that frankly is targeted to the millennial population. But when you repurpose it, whether it's smart wellness or connected homes, it can be extraordinarily valuable for the older adult. And then the data flow is extraordinarily interesting when you think about telemedicine, you think about long-term care environments, and you think about finally getting not to just uh, preventative health, but predictive health. Um, and and um, we're super excited uh, as these things come. Uh, in this area, just so you guys know, you happen to live in Silicon Valley of aging. From here to Philadelphia is the epicenter of the most forward-thinking senior living communities in the United States. Uh, we work with many of them, uh, Masonic Village being the closest down in Elizabethtown, uh, which is a beautiful facility that does just a phenomenal job. And uh, we're working with them to modernize senior living to get out of um, kind of the traditional environments and starting to uh, expand their reach. And, and technology is a big part of it. And this is not technology that is being kind of done to seniors, 
but rather understanding what can create value for older adults uh, so that they engage with it, they get first order value from it, but it's also throwing off a tremendous amount of data that can help those that care for them, whether professional caregivers or even family members uh, that would like to, uh, to engage. So I'm uh, looking forward to the discussion and appreciate the uh, opportunity. Thank you, Derek. Uh, next up is uh, uh, Sher Sharon uh, Miyamoto. She's an assistant professor at the College of Nursing. Okay, thank you. My, there we go. Working. Um, thank you very much. Um, so I'm excited to talk to you about the uh, safety system. Um, so I'm the director of the sexual assault, I guess I'll just stand here, uh, and then I'll move over. Uh, sexual assault forensic examination telehealth center. Um, which is a Department of Justice Office for Victims of Crime um, funded initiative. So my background um, as a nurse practitioner was that I conducted, um, I worked in a child advocacy center and did exams that were forensic in nature. Um, so I've conducted about 4,000 pediatric and adolescent sexual assault exams. Um, and then I've had about 15 years of experience really thinking about telehealth models of care. So really working to kind of combine those two things. You all have the clicker. Oh, sorry. Oh. <laughs> okay. Um, one more slide. Sorry, everyone. I'm sorry. So it's like I step. There we go. Oh, you know what? Maybe I have to go there. Okay. All right. So, um, sexual assault is a public health crisis um, in the United States, and same nurses. Thank you. Our sexual assault nurse examiners. Um, are specifically trained to respond to victims when they come in for care. Um, when, when patients are cared for by SANE nurses, we know that physical, mental health, and judicial outcomes are better for them than when they're cared for by untrained emergency department providers. The problem in this field is that there are very few people who are trained to deliver this care, very few SANE nurses. Um, it's an emotionally burdensome area, and so turnover and burnout are really high. There is no opportunity for peer review if you're working in a rural or underserved area. And so because of those things, we know there are tremendous disparities in the quality of care based on your address. So we've created a hub and spoke model where an expert nurse supports a less experienced nurse in a rural or underserved community hospital and are able through our systems to be able to see and interact with the patient as if they're in the room. And we're also able to get have, see exactly what is seen by the local nurse behind the safety scope, which is a device that we've created that allows us to identify injuries and identify any evidence that might be missed so that we can um, point that nurse to, to actually collect that correctly. So what happens in a lot of hospitals is that when a patient comes in for care, an untrained healthcare provider may open a forensic examination kit and read the instructions of some, in front of someone who's just experienced a trauma failing to deliver the trauma-informed, patient-centered care that we know promotes healing. So when hospitals partner with our hub, we actually ensure that an advocate is present for the patient. Um, we work with that local provider to ensure that that patient is cared for without judgment or blame. And we actually act as a second brain for that local nurse. These are really long exams. They can take three to six hours. There's lots of tasks involved. But we want to make sure that that patient actually is really cared for in that moment and their emotional needs are cared for as well. So we act as a second brain for someone who doesn't have a lot of experience to do this and help with documentation and correct evidence collection. Um, we have started this work, um, uh, actually putting this in place a little under a year ago in our first three sites in, uh, in Pennsylvania. And in the next six months, we will expand to four more sites and Hershey will be one of our partner sites um, starting in January. Um, so I was asked to provide a little bit of outcome data. We've, um, in under a year, we've done, had 37 total calls, 28 that actually resulted in examinations that we participated in. And I was gonna give you a little bit, I'm gonna scooch through some of these around system outcomes, but we're working with really small critical access hospitals that have really championed this in their community and have created call systems, paying their nurses for their time where they used to rely on their kind of goodwill by coming in from home because they were the only person who knew how to do, deliver that care. We've seen more nurses come to the work because it was scary to do by themselves and now they feel that they really have a partner in that care. We also have advocacy outcomes. So advocates are those in the local community that are purely there for the patient. And the second quote is really my very favorite one. 
and what we hope we will see happen. So we're going to track health outcomes for the patients that are cared for um, in partnership with our center. And what we hope is if we do this warm handoff, we say, please call the advocate at the same time you call us. Make sure they're there that they get a warm handoff and patients are more likely to take up the good health care that we have to offer them around good mental health care rather than coming back into the emergency room for suicidal ideation, depression, anxiety, all of the other aspects of trauma that can show up. Um, just This is a little tough to read, but I wanted to point to you the, the green bars. We asked patients, what were you worried about about coming in for care? Were you worried about being judged? Were you worried that, about being blamed, that you worried that you weren't, wouldn't be believed? The blue bars represent, at the end of the exam, resolution of that worry. Did you feel, did you feel that you were believed? So we're actually seeing com almost complete resolution of the things that people were worried about when they've ex had one of our um, examinations. We also ask patients to rate the quality of care, and again, this is very early, so our numbers are low, um, but we're really seeing that people are rating that their care overall provided in that local hospital is really high. And my, the third one down, um, that the examination helped me to feel better. When I talk to law enforcement, um, just generally people in the public think that these exams are painful and traumatizing in themselves, and I really believe that they're not. When you're, they're done with someone who really knows how to do this work well, I always say that I really believe it's the first step in healing, and I think that we're seeing our patients are endorsing that as well. So I am going to um, just give, end on some quotes that we have from our patients, and thank you. Thank you very much. Um, going back to my initial statement, um, I think that all four of these projects address my true definition of a, of a solution. And I uh, would like to thank the panelists for their uh, work and, uh, and ongoing uh, devotion to these things. Um, I'm going to ask a couple of questions before we open it up. Uh, one, uh, one, uh, if you can briefly, each one of you, um, discuss what challenges uh, you met in uh, either uh, uh, designing or implementing your projects? We'll go down. Um, you know, I think some of the greatest challenges are finding administrators that really care about the issue and are willing to work to layer quality over the care that is already provided. Um, so, while we're seeing good outcomes now, um, I think it's tough to get your first champions to come forward. And so we do a lot of work in the community to try and assess who might have this need and really involve larger community partners. Um, so bringing in advocates and law enforcement and district attorneys, um, I think was, was part of how we overcame that. But I, I, we still have that issue of why aren't there more people like beating down the door, um, you know, hoping to partner with us. And I think some of it is that we don't have a lot of data out there. Um, but also it's an area of healthcare where we can do it in the emergency room, but who's going to pay for doing it really well um, and pay for that layer of quality? I think that's our great issue. Uh, so for us, it was overcoming the misconception that, quote unquote, seniors don't like technology. Um, turns out uh, seniors don't like technology designed for people 50 years younger than them. Um, shockingly, uh, but if you design with them in mind, both in form and in function, right? It's actually, it, we often think about form, bigger letters and higher contrast ratio. It's actually function as well. Like what problems do they actually have and what do they want to solve? Um, um, so we, we, you know, for every 100 VCs we talked to, 99 of them told us we were crazy. Uh, you know, you keep going. There's a variety of the uh, classic entrepreneurial journey. Um, that's now changing pretty dramatically, and, and a big part of that, and I would encourage anybody as you're doing these solutions, and it sounds like folks here are doing that, is talk to your end user, right? I mean, in the end, uh, if I was building something for myself, I probably could bring a set of capabilities and knowledge, and uh, as they say, you scratch your own itch a little bit, and a lot of companies are, are formed that way. For us, by definition, we were serving a, a, a target demographic that was not us. Uh, the good news with seniors is, broadly, they're retired, so they have a lot of spare time. Uh, they also, uh, they also, uh, and I mean this very nicely, uh, the, the notion of losing the filter over time, it's actually really good when you're building a product. Nobody would tell us what we wanted to hear, they told us what they actually thought. And uh, as long as you listen and react to that, it's actually a really uh, positive group. So if you come to our office, probably every other week you'll see a van outside from a local senior living community. We buy lunch and uh, we listen and we observe and it's been huge for us to create products that, that people actually want and use. 
Let's go ahead, Andrew. I'm going to um, first reiterate Sheridan's point about champions. I think our project was successful because we did have champions coming from all different areas, including the clinicians, the nurses, and um, kind of most importantly, the patients and caregivers, because if they're not showing uh, their, their comfort and um, acceptance of this system, it wouldn't really get off the ground. But I think a, another challenge, which we certainly have not figured out yet, is how we pay for these technologies we are um, right now purchasing and giving out to the patients in our clinic um, with the idea that this, is, this disease is very cyclical. There's a lot of lending programs that go on in, in the ALS community, but exactly how we pay for a breathing device that may or may not be, uh, it may work very well, but may or may not be FDA approved, how, the, uh, uh, how we're going to initiate and uh, in ventilation off that and how we're going to pay for the procedures and the services that follow. And I can piggyback very easily on that. So payment model is the biggest challenge with ECHO as well. So I mentioned this is not telemedicine. That also means telemedicine payments don't apply. So thinking about how do we look at healthcare reform where there are payment models put into place for better education of frontline providers who can then care for patients. Until we figure that equation out, you'll see a lot of this work funded by grants, uh, potentially funded by payers who have the investment in a population to seek better care uh, and, and can identify the potential return on that investment by keeping the, the, the patient at the primary care um, office instead of coming for specialty care, which is, of course, by definition, more expensive. Um, the, the next step of that in our work is to develop that evidence base that can demonstrate that uh, improved patient outcomes. That's a, that's a very uh, real need in this area in order to advocate for new payment models. But one of the challenges is we work with the providers, we don't work with their patients. So we have to think hard about that prior panel that talked about leveraging electronic healthcare records and how do we utilize that to demonstrate the impact that providers have within their clinical setting as a result of participating in ECHO. And I, uh, I think this whole payment thing, you know, you hate to just dwell on, on the money, but it is all about the money, uh, especially in healthcare today, which is very important. Um, with regards to future directions, which I'm going to have each one of you um, touch on, you know, you hear a lot about big companies like Apple and Google getting into healthcare, and it, it seems a bit scary for a clinician to hear this, but I think from an entrepreneurial standpoint and from a payment standpoint, this may be the only way in which technologies like this get into the marketplace. The, uh, I was, <clears throat> I represented a couple of companies who presented as finalists to uh, uh, actually a, a competition that Comcast, uh, who has a division in healthcare, believe it or not, <clears throat> was, was offering. And basically, I think these companies feel the potential, certainly economically, because that's what their modus operandi is, but also from a consumer, customer, slash patient, caregiver standpoint, the potential of these technologies. And I think that that's what <clears throat> payers, including the, the federal government, don't, you know, are hesitant to, to get into um, for some justifiable reasons. But healthcare is moving a lot slower than the rest of, of of industries and sectors in our society. Um, I'd just like to have each one of you address where you would like to see your future directions going, whether it's longitudinally and expanding what you're doing or, uh, or different directions. So I think that that's a really great vision to keep in mind. I think for ECHO, one of the challenges we face in um, medical sciences today is that we, we actually make very small incremental increases in people's health with the newer discoveries. The biggest impact we could potentially have is using things we already know work and implementing those in the community where they're needed. So one of the strengths of ECHO is getting that evidence base out to the community, but not only getting that information there, reinforcing that and improving the quality of care that's happening in the everyday small town America and, and even big cities. So the health disparities that we see are not a result of in, you know, lack of use of the latest and greatest chemotherapeutic regimen. They're the fact that the vast majority of our um, ethnic minorities don't receive appropriate treatment for their hypertension. So these are not 
advancements that you know make the front page news, but they're so necessary to improve public's health. So how do we utilize programs like ECHO to get that information and that quality care information to the primary care doctors at the front line of this? Hi. Uh, goals for this project might be just my goals. I can't speak for all the ALS clinicians out there, but the model for ALS over the last few decades has been that multidisciplinary care is the top of the line you can do, meaning the person comes to see not just the specialist in neurology during their visit to the clinic, but they're seeing the social worker, the physical therapist, the occupational therapist, the, the psychologist, um, and others. Um, and everyone at the ALS meetings, they're patting themselves on the back for thinking of this, and they're, it's, it's, it's a really great model, but there really is um, an unmet need when you have to group all those specialties together. They only happen once every three to six months. So for a disease that's as short-lived as ALS, I'd like, to be able to, um, I'd like to be able to say that we can do a better job at tracking people who might progress quickly versus uh, identifying those who will uh, experience some rapid decline in either breathing, swallowing, or ambulatory function, um, and, and being able to address those limitations. I think we have an opportunity through telehealth to change the model of the multidisciplinary clinic, and uh, that's what we're doing. And so uh, two parts uh, to, my, to my answer. Uh, first of all, we started with the four to four and a half percent in the United States that live in long-term care facilities, so this could be voluntary, like a life plan community where you move into a, a retirement living, as it's called, in, in Pennsylvania, independent living is more common in other states, uh, and then you progress through uh, different levels of care, uh, or uh, often in the for-profit side, if you have a, an issue, a fall, you move into an assisted living or uh, uh, whatnot for, for, for ultimately, often very long periods of time. But it's still 4.5% of the older adults in the United States. So our goal is to work with a lot of those entities to take that model into the home. The home model has struggled because it's been a very manual, like hop in the car and drive to the home uh, uh, model. Uh, we believe that we can change the economics of that. But the one thing I'll, I'll touch on, and I think a challenge maybe for all of us, um, uh, you know, today, the only way I can get my Epic data from my John Hopkins days when I lived in DC and my Duke days, uh, when, which is where I go to now, is through Apple's health app. It's the only way I can do it. Right? And so as much as I agree, Apple and Amazon and others have a lot to learn about the industry, we have a lot to learn about software from them. And when it comes down to it, people buy Apple Watches not because they have to, but because it creates an actual value. And then you layer the health and wellness on top of it. Right? And I actually think from a usability perspective, uh, I, I spent a decade of my early career at IBM, and in the late 90s, uh, Bank of America still thought it was a bank that had some financial spend, or sorry, technology spend. In fact, their CIO reported to the CFO, their CTO reported to the CFO. Today, they know they're a technology company that's in the financial services industry. It's a huge shift, and it's starting to happen, and I agree that the, this industry has, is a bit behind that, and I'm not saying that we're not gonna have the same care, some care models and there's still not the personal components to it, but every industry is becoming a technology industry. And, and I think it's imperative that we pay attention to that and create great user experiences and become great software people. Yeah, I, I would hate for my hospital to become the next blockbuster. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I'll be Netflix. <laughs> Sherry? Um, yeah, so I think about sustainability of these programs a lot because the last thing we want to do is put things that people find valuable um, out in the field and then, and then be home to grant funding only. So um, ideally, the way I would like to see this grow is that we have the opportunity through grant funded initiatives to really show that these models are effective and, and be able to demonstrate Um, and when I think about sexual assault, I think there are a couple things. Um, one, that, that we probably need to educate the public a little bit better about what the care should look like. Um, so I think about do we need centers of excellence? And so if you are 
I'll open this up to uh, questions or comments from the audience. Well, I'll just say that um, telehealth with regards to clinician patient interactions is certainly becoming more accepted. It's still only about five to 18% of interactions now are via telehealth. Um, so even though they're offered by, by a lot of payers, it is only paid for by Medicare in certain rural areas, so that has to expand. And I also think, and I, I had some skeptical um, thoughts about this initially, but there are uh, proposals or there's <coughs> talk about clinicians being specifically specialized and or trained in telehealth and I think that Sheridan's model is very important with regards to it, it takes the interaction to a different level and it creates a, a literal barrier between the, the patient and the clinician. So that in and of itself may hinder from a psychological standpoint the encounter. However, patients knowing, and I, and I know this from, from wireless monitoring of devices, they may be comforted by the fact that they, number one, have more access, even though it's not person to person in, in physical realms, uh, to care. Um, but I, I think that people trained specifically in this area because of, of, these, of these special circumstances from a, um, a human interaction standpoint may be um, you know, advantageous. While, while a different industry, uh, higher education actually is a really good example of this, right? In the early 2000s, most established universities, Penn State included, pushed back on the notion of distance learning. Like, broadly, it was like, whoa, whoa, whoa our business model is to have people come to State College or whatever campus, move in and have professors there and do research. That was the business model. And that saw the emergence of University of Phoenix and, and all these for-profits that said, well, we don't have a business model, so that, that internet thing seems like a good idea. <laughs> well, fast forward to today, Penn State's a, a top uh, physical institution and a top five or 10, depending on what list you look at, continuing education and distance education. They've been able to have both. And, I, and they don't have different professors for one or the other, right? They're, di they're broadly using the same fixed assets to, to touch way more lives and the core business model is as strong as it's ever been and now they're able to educate folks that aren't necessarily in Pennsylvania as an example. So I think there's some parallels to other industries that we can look at. of the caregiver, whether the caregiver is a family member or not, at the site of care or at a distance. And, um, and I think that these uh, projects really um, look to that, whether it's clinician to clinician or uh, clinician to patient. And I think that what Derek stated before is cannot be understated with regards to any technology company or, or healthcare entity needs to consider the, the end user. And, and I think that while in the last five years um, uh, there has been an, a huge expansion and consolidation of healthcare facilities, that's really been done on a financial basis. 
And, and really, I think that healthcare needs to come back to the patient and caregiver and, and have them incorporated into what is needed, um, whether it's a technology or whether it's uh, an institution. So, um, you know, I, I can't, I don't know how you would, I think it's gonna be, needs to be customized, certainly, but input into clinical trials, into, into pilot studies of this nature should have the, the, clin the clinician, but also incorporate patients and, and mm -hmm. caregivers as well. Yes, sir. How much do you feel the technology education component plays a huge in this area? For each and different markets, each have different sets of needs. Um, it seems to me like there's a huge need out there just in technology in general to both educate people that are building technology and people that are using technology what the common goal is. I'm just curious how that impacts and where the needs are in each of the areas. That's a good question. I, I think that's a fantastic question. So our, our telehealth platform utilizing Zoom, it works really great for our conference, but when I was talking about um, our need for research, you know, we're reliant on the electronic health record data, and that is where the challenge comes. So for all the reasons that were discussed by the prior panel, we face the same issues. Uh, it's not a useful tool for research at the, in the current state for, for a the vast majority of institutions across the country. So there's a huge need. I would love to have a research voice at the table when uh, EHRs are designed or, or um, uh, corrupted, revised. That's a whole other <laughs> conference. <laughs> yeah, so as I, um, in our two uh, kind of example studies that I showed, we're using uh, relatively new um, startup technologies that have been designed with that sleek user interface in mind. And as you mentioned, that sleek user interface might not be the best interface for a population whose average age is 65 in, in, in our clinic. So um, if people are going to be designing medical applications, um, maybe making the back button, which is intuitive to me where, where it might be on my phone, making it more accessible to someone who, who uh, may not have grown up around that type of technology. So we're lucky we're, we're in these larger care settings, right? So these communities and from 100 residents to some of our communities are 100 or uh, 1,500 to 2,000 residents. So they already have programming and education that's built in, right? There's yoga classes and there's uh, you know cooking classes, and so we're embedding ourselves in there. But in many ways, the the key is just what you described is um, you know. With my six-year-old, I didn't have to teach her how to use an iPad. It was intuitive. And like, it's really, really hard to build intuitive design. Like, I'm old enough to remember like when you bought a computer, like it came with a book, and you were supposed to like read it. It doesn't come with a book anymore. There's not even things to hook together, right? It's just like plug this into the wall, and you're good to go. That takes a long time, and it also takes um, a, a kind of a, you have to be purposeful about the journey you're gonna take your end user on. Um, one of the more interesting things they do recently, iOS 13 just came out, right? Um, if you go back and look at iOS 1, it was a lot of scomorphic, meaning they took real world stuff and put, put it on digital. So the notebook looked like a yellow notebook, right? It, it literally had texture like the notebook. They were purposeful in taking us on a journey that took us from the physical into the, into the digital. It took, you know, broadly 11 years. So we, we are often too much in a hurry, and we often assume other people have the same baseline we have that we've been taking on that journey together. I think you gotta look at different age demographics, you gotta look at um, their experience level, and then you gotta think about what are the user interface. Like with older adults right now, we're having uh, unbelievable success from almost across the board with voice, right? And, and obviously that's being generated, created for the next generation, but what's the most natural way to communicate for all of us from day one? Uh, which is voice, and, and there's some really interesting stuff around uh, uh, the new voice models, natural language models around being able to reconstruct the speech of a stroke victim after the fact. Like, I've heard recordings that I can't make out what the person is saying, and the computer can put it back together. I think we're in the very early days of this, and this computer-human interaction space just continues to need more and more research and more and more purposeful thinking. something that ultimately becomes easy to use. 
students. And as we were trying to do the fiscally responsible piece of taking some, you know, things that Penn State owns, things off the shelf, and trying to piece it together, um, ultimately resulted in, you know, I was like, well, I have 50 steps before somebody's actually connected. Um, so I think, one, we had to have a commitment to making sure that people really knew how to use what we were giving them in the local community. So we spent a lot of time and, and training and touch and base. Um, but it also led us to say, what's out there isn't really good enough. And we felt like we really needed to um, find funding and invest in something that could be more useful, not only for us, but to share with other people that are trying to do this work out there. Um, so I think that's a tough spot, is to find something fiscally responsible, works well, and I think a lot of us are finding that we have to build it ourselves, potentially. My, my thoughts on this are, um, I think it, it goes to the term called user experience, and I think that user experience experts need to be incorporated in any technology that's developed in healthcare with the end user not only in mind but participating in the process and, and that it should be an iterative, iterative, iterative process with regards to alpha testing and not waiting till the whole thing is built and then sending it out there finding that there are problems with the system. The other thing I'm, I'm always concerned about is health literacy, and this goes into user experience, but a lot of health literacy is a term that incorporates the ability of a, a patient to not only understand what was uh, spoken to them, whether it's, it's on, a, on a cell phone, Google, you know, explaining what a disease is, or, or a physician in person, um, being able to understand it and being able to spit it back in, in, uh, in their own terms. But there's a lot that goes into health literacy, some of which incorporates cultural differences, language differences, disability differences, um, and, and so you're touching on a point that is critical with regards to the development of, of technology, and these things need to be incorporated because they ultimately will affect whether the technology is successful or not. Any other David, I, I think our challenge today is the fact that we, we have such a, a difference in technology acceptance that has changed through generations. And, and if we're having devices that have to work across disease states and other disability states that transcend generations, you really have to be multimodal uh, in order to have real influence. I'm convincing my 94-year-old mother that a face on this two robot was actually the doctor in another hospital <laughs> worried about her stroke. Right. It was yep. pretty hard. <laughs> yep. Look like this silly robot at her by, with a face on it. Yep. She was in this environment. This person was helping. And, and yet, I have the, the advantage of being this age that I have grandchildren who have no idea there are other people in the they have no idea they're perfectly happy yeah. to interact with our medicine. My granddaughters get all their nutrition by telemedicine from doctors. So and, and they work out of the payment scheme for that price of copay, which I think is wonderful. So it, it really is a challenge for the tactical sector yep. starting with my students to understand yeah. the, the user interface and how humans interact with <laughs> oh, where? Look, 83%, 83% today are moving into independent living with a smartphone. 83% is the fastest growing demographic for high speed internet, for, for mobile technology, for I'm 100%. It's interesting though, the, um, so I was a computer engineer undergrad. I graduated in 2001. Um, we never had a class on computer human interaction. It didn't exist, it's a new discipline, right? Like the notion of design. Now, at the time, design was little, I mean, what we were gonna design. There was no smartphone, there was, there was a bunch of things I'm missing. I was over at, at Penn State Harrisburg today, there is a class just on computer interface. How to interact with computers, how to think about a design principle. So a lot of this stuff is uncharted territory, right? And, and I think a lot of this multimodal is the right word. If we're building systems that can be consumed and interacted with in different ways. I grew up more in a keyboard mouse, so I find myself defaulting to keyboard mouse because that's my baseline. I have a younger brother who grew up more mobile and he defaults to touch. 
it's just all our different baselines, right? I think David touched on right now we're teaching our students agile. Yep. And, and agile development for those who aren't there is, is rapid turnaround time. Smart. This comes to real world experiences as a cardiologist. I, when I open my electronic chart to look at a patient, the first thing I, I have to see is whether the patient had their immunizations, whether they have guns at home, whether you know they're depressed or not. Not that I don't care if they're depressed or not, but the point is I'm looking at all this primary care stuff and I don't see anything really that's relevant to what I am taking care of the patient for. So this user experience in electronic records is a core um, cause of physician burnout, believe it or not. And, and so it, it gets to everyday interactions that, that people have with regards to user experience. So. Yes, ma'am. So actually the University of New Mexico has a worldwide license with Zoom for Project Echo, so everyone in Echo can utilize Zoom and that office has, offers us the opportunity to provide it free of charge to the primary care doctors. The great thing about it is there, there is an app for that um, and so we've actually had some of our primary care doctors provide, you know, co coming to our sessions with it on their app as they're going into their office and, and they continue to and they're a great example. They have other lines of business that are outside of the medical space. And so like they've been forced just from pure competition to create good user experiences. Otherwise they would have got destroyed by somebody else. Um, and so they actually have a wonderful product suite uh, across, whether you're uh, in the wellness space or you're trying to do an online demo, right? They've got a, a, a great set of cases. So our um, ALS clinic initially used a cobbled together program based on the Adobe um, suite up until 20, 2018, but uh, then the ALS program went on to use the Penn State Health On Demand platform, which I can't answer probably better than some people here can, so chime up if you can, but it, ALS Clinic is one of the first programs along with I think dermatology and emergency medicine who have access to see patients through that um, Penn State Health uh, interface. Yeah. It does. They have limitations on what phone they have. 
In terms of coaching and walking people through things, yes, we have to have a training period with them to do this. So the nice thing is we do it over telehealth. Um, we can you know, call them up, say, did you get your device? And they say, yeah, I got it in the mail. Let's walk through this. And, and, and we'll walk them through how to, how to go over that. Um, this is a, like I said, it's a, it, a technology-driven product. It's uh, got iOS and, and Android support. So we haven't had many issues from the device itself. We've, we've actually good choice on the device on my part, I guess. But um, the issues we um, have had growing pains with is the actual telehealth platform itself. My take is, you know, if you look at other uh, massive shifts, uh, revolutions tend to happen very rev uh, evolutionarily, right? Even like the founding of our country, we like, we like to think about it as if it happened one day, right? It was like a long time between when they decided we're going to start a country and they even realized they did it, right? And so if I look at you, brought up Blockbuster. Blockbuster and Netflix coexisted for 13 years. Right? We all look at it as if it was obvious now looking back. And so I think it's going to be the market pressure. Like we have no choice. In the senior space, there's going to be a shortage of 200,000-ish caregivers. So we have no choice. We're going to, it's going to force some of these things to, to come to bear. Um, but I also think like the, the market will, will drive us in that, in that direction. And, and, and ultimately, we are probably already in that uh, moment. This stuff is already happening. You just got to zoom out and look at it over a decade or 15 years, and you go, oh, yeah, like that really began in 2015 with X, Y, and Z, and then we're in 2025, and of course, it's all obvious looking backwards, right? And so to me, um, uh, those things are going to happen out of necessity. The other one that was brought up earlier, one of the things we're super interested in is um, uh, automating regulation. Seems a little meta, but uh, when you think about best practices within your organization, we should teach our tools. Not to, to, we shouldn't have to teach the people how to use the tools. The tools should teach them how to do best practices. I describe it as like bumper bowling, right? We're not going to tell them exactly what to do, but we're going to make sure they don't get a gutter ball. And, and, and making tools, and you're seeing more folks, they're, they're starting to make machine readable regulation. Um, if you can start to do those things, it actually changes the whole dynamic of who's able to provide the care and the best practice. It's in many ways what you're doing with humans as the best practices, but if you can start to train the systems to guide people, I think you can get much more leverage, kind of superhuman strength out of the individual character. Great. I'd like to thank the panelists, and uh, we'll be available for questions.